Welcome back! I've got a great one for you here. This video covers the must-play Amstrad CPC games of all time. I think this video will also be massively beneficial to those new to the Amstrad CPC. Maybe there's people from other parts of the world that just want to know more about this wonderful system. And despite being considered the third machine in the UK, the Amstrad really packed a punch. So, as they say, on with the show! The Amstrad 464 is the 64K home computer with a monitor and data recorder included. Only our competitors aren't having fun. When 8-bit software is this good, you'll see it around for a long time. As the title suggests, 3D Grand Prix Racing is the name of the game here, with the player firmly in the driving seat. Without question, this is the best Formula 1 game available for the Amstrad CPC. Don't be too keen though, as a sharp corner is never far away. There's eight circuits to master, based on real life racing tracks. To advance to the next race, you basically have to finish in the top three. And the big advantage this has over the BBC Micro version is in the Amstrad you get wing mirrors. 3D Star Strike is far from perfect. I played this one before adding to this list as I didn't want nostalgia to kick in. Half an hour later, I'm still playing it. There's a tad of slowdown when the screen gets busy, but this doesn't detract from the fun one iota. In my personal, humble opinion, it's better than Star Wars. That's not saying Star Wars is bad, just that this is better. If there is to be a minor gripe about this game, and let's stress emphasis on minor, it's that there's no inbuilt high score table. Right, time to have another go. This is the Eric Bristow, Phil Taylor and Jockey Wilson of Dark Games, all rolled into one for the Amstrad CPC. Yes folks, Mastertronics 180 is a gaming masterpiece. Pound for pound, there's no other dart sim quite like it. Back in the day, this would have been well worth your dosh. It has lots of personality and charm, great controls, it doesn't take itself too seriously and it has a fantastic challenge. That's not to say it's easy, it's anything but. And when you do finally pull off a win, you'll be punching the air. As much as I love Mode Zero and all those colours, the programmers took a very wise decision to use the Amstrad's high resolution mode of graphics. And as you can see, all that extra detail has really paid off. First off, and for a flight sim, this is really exciting. I'm not going to lie to you, it's a complex game, but there's 10 highly absorbing events and if you like, it will kind of hold your hand as you go through them. Naturally, with this type of game, for some unknown reason, the sound department is always left wanting. So, as you can expect and hear, the sound effects are dire. I appreciate this won't be to everybody's taste, but if flight sims do float your boat, this is difficult to better on the Amstrad CPC. This is one of those games where it feels difficult right from the start and that will put most people right off. But please don't despair. The control system is brilliant but the investment here is the long term challenge which is considerable and it's the tight controls and the addictive quality nature of this game that will pull you back in. If you judge it, if you stand back and judge it purely as a platform game, it's one of the best on the Amstrad and it still looks good. Games developer Digital Integration took a bit of a risk with this Stealth Fighter game. They massively switched things around and changed the emphasis from realism to an almost arcade-like experience. And I have to say the result was some of the best tactical action in arcade star gaming I've seen. You start with intelligent briefings and you can pretty much create your own mission from there. Then you load up your advanced tactical fighter with the weapons and supplies that you need. And then you head out over a wireframe oasis of landscapes to assist your forces in winning the battle. After the War is a game that is well worth your time and energy. But the graphics are some of the best I've seen during the commercial life of the Amstrad CPC. The first stage couldn't be simpler. Beat your opponents to a pulp. And on the second, what better way to celebrate and play a game than going on a machine gun spree? This makes the list because it's more than enough if you want a solid, playable arcade game. It scrolls nicely and uses the Amstrad's colour palette to great effect. 
Get to the chopper! Here's the problem with Afterburner, or any arcade conversion. Never in a month of Sunday is the Amstrad CPC, or any 8-bit for that matter, going to reproduce an exact copy of the original arcade machine. It's nearly impossible. The main thing you can hope for is they've captured the playability somewhat. Despite all of the above, the programmers at Activision have done an absolutely stupendous job in bringing this arcade conversion to the humble Amstrad CPC. A great arcade conversion then. Time to head back to the danger zone. I can't for the life of me think why, but this game used to scare the shizzle out of me. Regardless of how well you perform, the game remains exciting and nail-biting throughout. As we all know, in space, nobody can hear you scream. Once upon a time, a very long, long time ago, my neighbours weren't so lucky. If you can try to get your head around the control system and minimal graphics, even in 2021, you are in for a scream. I mean a treat. Check out that quote. This one had to make the list, and it's just a matter of practice. There is a way to win quickly at this game. You just have to move Ripley as quickly as possible and without firing. Then repeat the same with another character and park them just outside the Queen's Chamber. Once you've done that, you should have saved enough ammo to then blow the door and wipe everything out in the Queen's Chamber. But technically, that feels like cheating. Still, it's a fantastic game and it goes to show that movie conversions can actually work. You have two minutes to complete each level. This is a very tricky game indeed. You'll need to think before you zap. I mean, back in the day, this would have been an absolute cracker at budget. And is it just me, but this still looks great today? <laughs> it all adds up to a mildly enjoyable game that borders on the abstract, which is both satisfying and, for the most part, non-violent. An absolute thing of beauty. I love the original Arkanoid, especially in the arcade, but it's the second one, despite a few technical issues. And I played this religiously as a child, and even now, look at it, it's a great looking game, and it plays brilliantly. It's also a little bit more optimised than the original on the Amstrad CPC, there's hardly any slowdown. You could actually release this today on Android or uh, iPhone, and I think it would still sell. So that's my thoughts on this, and why it makes the list. There's no point buying a game based on the armed forces, getting it home, and then finding out that you've completed it on your first couple of goes. So it was great to find out that this was as rock hard as the title suggested. I'm no masochist, but I like a challenge. And in that department, in 2021, this game still provides one. And with the majority of Amstrad CPC games, I used to just play my own music. With this one, it's turned up loud. This is a superlative run-and-gun shooter for the Amstrad CPC. Right from the word go, you're in the thick of it. It throws you straight into the deep end. At first, it looks a bit too colourful, a bit too blocky. But by the end of it, this is part of its charm. And look at you look, it's another dynamic game, which means it's absolutely rock solid. You've got to love the Spanish and their games. ATV Simulator makes the list, woohoo! And I will not be persuaded otherwise. I will not be moved on this. It's certainly no powerhouse in the graphics department or the sound department, but it's got bags of playability. And get this, it's two player. My cousin and I, we would play this until the cows come home. Heidi, hi Robert, if you're listening. Also, we used to listen to the title music from David Whittaker uh, for like 10, 20 minutes, it was that good. It makes the list for two reasons, nostalgia and great playability. This is easily one of my favorite games from the old world. It's just good old fashioned slapstick. You don't really see this style of game anymore. And this is a heart back to Gremlin graphics at their best. 
I believe it plays great on the Commodore 64 and the MSX as well, but the Amstrad CPC version is certainly not to be sniffed at and makes the list. Apparently the name for this title was taken from the hit series of Wiedersehen Pet, which is German for See You Later. Why hey man, this is a great game pet. The first game, Way of the Tiger, took up about 148k of memory, it was loaded in sections and back in the day I had a lot of time and respect for it. The graphics, the colour wasn't great but the graphics were really highly detailed but the game was just too slow and when you've got that sense of ploughing through treacle in a game it zaps away all the fun. This second game however, Avenger, for me was ahead of its time and still plays a blinder. Now if there's one thing that you can't ever criticise the Amstrad CPC for, it's isometric 3D games. Let's face it and embrace it, the Amstrad CPC was the daddy of isometric 3D. Me personally, I love these isometric 3D games. And this one is especially brilliant. The programmers opted for Mode Zero in this game, and this is a testament to how amazing it can look. In the words of Gavin and Stacey, well Stacey, that's lush, that is. It's still a great game on the Amstrad, but it's essential to map it. For me, this one is another classic for the Amstrad, and look, it got an AA rave. Uh, so you basically have to bounce Eric the ball around the screen, change the colours of the blocks, pick up bonus objects, fight off chasers, and try to amass a larger score as possible. To the untrained eye, this is just another bouncing ball game. To the rest of us, the people in the know, what you've got here is hour upon hours of challenging fun. I never knew it, but this is set in a post-apocalyptic world. Humanity had almost wiped itself out. Apparently man has now learned from his mistakes and peace reigns throughout the galaxy and the only battles are fought on this grid called the Ball Blazer Playfield. The pseudo 3D for the time and sprite scaling along with the colours are absolutely magnificent and this is a budget game. There's nine skill levels as well and you can adjust the game length but the best bit is it's two player. Back in the 80s this looked like a picture and it felt faultless in design and execution. I mean we'd all seen combat games before but nothing took it to this level. If you're a bit squeamish or you've got a weak stomach definitely avoid. This was the first time my daughter of three has ever seen a head roll and it freaked her out. And I prefer this over the Commodore Amiga version and it's graphically superior to the other 8-bit versions as well. I don't know, I can't say for sure, but I think this game is the reason I'm really into boxing. I remember I used to sit on the sofa squashed in between my mum and dad playing Barry McGuigan's boxing on my Amstrad on the coffee table with my father there shouting jab him jab him as I think at first I was always looking for the knockout it's a fantastic little game as you can see with the awards from Amtix and Amstrad Action it was an absolute knockout I remember being really disappointed that there was no sound or music in this game but then, all of a sudden it kicked in and I realised graphically and what this game was trying to do, there was nothing else like it. Also, thinking about it, I was just a kid when I played this and I didn't really appreciate it until later on. In fact, I remember now, I played the Amiga version, was blown away and came back to this and the Amstrad love affair for this game then began. It took me years to complete this game. The difficulty drove me batty. But I don't think there was anything like it uh, back in the day. It really stood out from the crowd. And when I think of the Amstrad's best games, and I think anybody for that case, uh, this always pops up within their top 10. I think personally for me, it's the most entertaining of its kind and it feels like a complete package with all the music, sound effects and wonderful Mode Zero graphics. I had to include it, 
it's an isometric classic as far as I'm concerned, a true thing of wonder, and um, I played this religiously back in the day. In fact, this was my Bible, and I mapped this game. Uh, I still remember, the de I could still play this now, and I know all the locations. Head Over Heels and Get Dexter are still top for me, but this one is difficult, albeit still uh, a fun challenge. I guess these types of shoot 'em up slash strategy games can be considered a little bit like Marmite. You either love them or hate them. Me personally, it's in the list. I love it. It's a great little battle across land, sea and air. And I like the fact that there's so many game styles. And apart from the sequel on the Commodore 64, I can't think of a game of this type or this style that's bettered it since. And by that, and just to be clear, I mean not on the Amstrad. So, this game was originally developed as a licensed Thundercats game. The story goes that uh, Elite had commissioned three different games for the license, and FTL had completed theirs first. So just to note, albeit not in name, this is an officially licensed Thundercats game. I can almost hear the music playing now. Thunder! Thunder! Thundercats! Ho! Now this is a great game. But also, I've got a bit of interesting trivia. There was an Amstrad GX4000 version of this. Uh, and it was based on the Amstrad CPC version as well. Now the differences with the GX4000 version is, instead of a save game functionality, it came with a password generator. Also, this 8-bit version, like the Amiga, had all the uh, conversations restored. It featured an improved cursor as well, and an animated title screen. Apparently, the code was finished. I'd forgotten this, but apparently, this is Codemaster's first ever published game. I mean, what an entry. And this is probably their best game ever. Damn them for not putting this much effort into all their other games. But what we can see here is mastery of Amstrad's Mode Zero color palette. The controls are tight. I mean, this really is, in terms of programming and graphics, a thing of beauty, a work of art. From the off, it does look like a specy port. But the detail and the tight controls in this game are what really makes it. On rare occasions, I can sometimes stomach a specy port, and this is one. And if it makes sense, it's not a specy port because it's got all the refinements that you'd expect from a game that was programmed exclusively to the Amstrad. Plus, what I like about this is you don't just fall off the edge of the stage and it's game over or you've lost a life. It's really good, I promise. Give it a go. Enough people say they know they can't believe UK have a bobsleigh team. Sorry, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. I'm an idiot. That film, Cool Runnings with John Candy. Unbelievable. This one must be good because um, Ace featured it. Ace Magazine featured it in their top 100 list for 87, 88. And Amstrad Action gave it a Master Game Award. And for me, this is unrivaled. And it works well as a computer game. It's fast and furious. Digital integration proving once more that nobody does it better. You can't be a good adventure game. And there's so many on the Amstrad CPC. I think only the Commodore and Specky rival or come close to the Amstrad uh, for adventure games. This isn't even my favourite. That wasn't me. Don't be so rude. But it's the funniest. And if you type Y at the command prompt, it will give you the reply number 42, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And it's put together all in the best possible taste. Has there ever been a better game than Bomb Jack in the arcade, let alone the Amstrad? I would say the only thing this arcade conversion misses is the original arcade score. And this is Another one of those games that features in the book 
1001 video games to play before you die. For me personally, not only the best 8-bit conversion, but the best version outside of the arcade. It's just a really good game. Now this is something I've not heard of before. Apparently Boulder Dash was so popular on the home computer that it was one of the first, I can't remember any others, home computer game to be ported to the arcade. Usually it was the other way around. I can also confirm that this game is absolutely brilliant. It doesn't look it, but the devil is in the playability. I can't believe there's not a single soul out there that hasn't played Boulder Dash in one form or another. If you've not played it on the Amstrad, you must check it out. Bounder is different. Everything looks neat and tidy, but be prepared to fail, and fail you will. For the life of me, I can't categorize this game. But is it really that important to put a label on it? All I can tell you is that this is fun. I think even now, if you approach this game today uh, and you start playing it, five minutes will turn into an hour. And despite any frustrations, it's got that one more go about it. I feel like I've got to defend this game. Um, it looks awful. Uh, the sprites aren't the best. The sound is absolutely dire. But um, Amstrad Action gave this a rave and saw the same qualities in it that I've seen and experienced. And I had to put it in the list because it really is so much fun. There you go, I've stated my case. Retro Gamer listed uh, Bruce Lee as uh, I think it was in issue 37 as one of the top 25 platformers of all time I think it was a poll I'm not sure if they meant the Amstrad and the Spectrum or just the Commodore 64 but it was in there Amtix even said that it should appeal to most gamesters everywhere definitely deserves to be a hit and they gave it 93% hence the Amtix accolade my personal opinion is that this is as good as the Commodore 64 version. This one is another Marmite experience. You're going to either love it or hate it. Um, a friend of mine, I showed it him, and he, and he was like, what a load of crap. But I, I don't get it. I, I really enjoy this game, and I've played it all the way through. So I have to go with my gut. I really enjoy it, and I'm going to add it. There's a good mixture of arcade action and puzzles within. And I think it's just as much fun as on the Atari ST and Amiga. I think the thing to remember is don't play this with the joystick, play it with the keys, because they messed up the joystick config. Okay, so I think the thing here is to forget about the Commodore 64 version. That's a completely different experience to this, as is the ZX Spectrum version. As an Amstrad racing game, this has got absolutely everything. And I believe the programmers got this conversion close to humanly possible on the Amstrad CPC. I mean, can you imagine if these programmers would have got the license for OutRun? So that's the high esteem I hold these programmers in and this game on the Amstrad. It's said that Donkey Kong and Space Panic were the inspiration for Chucky Egg. Nigel Alderton created an absolute all-time classic for the ZX Spectrum, which was later then ported to the Amstrad CPC. Originally known as Eggy Kong, Nigel was just 15 when he came up with the idea. But it's amazing the influence Shigeru Miyamoto had on Nigel. And this influence is why we still talk about and play Chucky Egg today. In fact, it was Nigel's game alone that put the software company ANF on the map. Captain Blood has an eerie, mysterious, dark feel about it. Originally put together for the Atari ST, the Amstrad CPC port when you consider the hardware limitations, is an absolute triumph. Captain Blood is massive. There's over 32,000 planets spread throughout the Hydra universe. You are essentially a space traveler. This is probably the weirdest game ever to grace the CPC. It's also one of the most beautiful. All that's left to say is thank you, Philippe Ulrich. It was programming legend David Perry that once said, People used to program flight simulators in less memory than it takes to store 
the eBay logo. So how on earth did they fit carrier command into just 64K? In fact, if you think about it, it was less than that because of the CPC 16K screen. I think carrier command almost kind of proves that the saying anything is possible is probably true. Carrier command takes 3D star strike to a whole new level. Here's a nice bit of trivia for you. As with the Dizzy games, Castle Master was also developed on the Amstrad CPC, which in itself just goes to tell a story about how capable the Amstrad CPC actually was. This same code on the Amstrad CPC ended up being ported to the Atari ST and Commodore Amiga 500. Now that's something to be proud of. It's said that the game also runs 10% faster than the previous versions, Dark Side Driller, and it's the best of the lot, better than Total Eclipse. Dare you enter. Now I originally played a championship jet ski simulator, but I know that there was a full price uh, jet bike simulator game. So the one I played, this one, is like a cut down 199, 299 version, where the other one was about 899 and 999. But as far as I'm concerned, it's every bit as good. Ace actually said that it was in their top 100, so who am I to argue? What a game. Majestic, magical, 16 color, where do you even start? It's the arcade conversion Commodore 64 fanboys can only ever dream of. Mind you, their arcade conversion of Power Drift and Turbo Outrun was pretty special. So then, an exciting little racer that had you as a cop chasing down the perps in your porker 9 to 8. Let's go, Mr. Driver. Now, I hummed and ahed about adding this one, but then I thought to myself, imagine a Ferrari instead of a Chevy, and you've got Outrun on the Amstrad CPC, so this shows that you can do it, it is possible. I mean, US Gold made it impossible, almost impossible, for us not to hate them. So technical achievements aside, this plays a blinder as well, it's absolutely brilliant. And there's five magnificent stages to drive through. While Melinda might be the girl of your dreams, she's also the one who has consented to allow you to join her computer club. I mean, really? My wife can't stand retro gaming or computer systems. Maybe that's a bit harsh, but she definitely thinks I'm a hoarder. So then, there's a condition, isn't there always? You've only got to go and prove your worth by putting your life in constant danger against bombs, fire, traps, you name it. At this point, alarm bells should be ringing and there should be great big red flags waving in the ether. This girl, gentlemen, is what's considered high maintenance. Excellent game though. I want to be a drill instructor. Without question, uh, firstly I apologise for the singing. Without question, one of the best, if not the best, joystick waggler on the Amstrad CPC. In fact, combat school is so good that you might want to get your head shaved before you start. And one of the easily one of the best multi-level arcade experiences and conversions to the Amstrad CPC. If I die in the combat zone, ship me up and take me home. Grenade! Commando is just as evil on the Amstrad as it was all those years ago in the arcade. You got to approach this game with a killer mentality. Seriously, if it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't, shoot it anyway. There's some ropey scrolling on level five, but without question, the Amstrad CPC arcade conversion is decent. This is one man versus an army, and only who dares wins two can perhaps match it. Now I thought this would have been inspired by the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Commando, but no, in fact, it was inspired by Rambo's First Blood and another movie called Missing in Action. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Nice try, Capcom. Sadly, this game isn't for everyone. Playing as Super Joe is super difficult, but it's also super bad, if you know what I mean. This is probably the best racing game on the Amstrad. In fact, Amstrad Action gave this 92% and a master game. They also said, as far as racing games go, this takes pole position. 
For me personally, this is just another fine example of how good RK conversions can actually turn out on the Amstrad CPC. Of course, all the luxuries afforded to the arcade machine have been done away with, but what we are left with is a racing game that should make anybody's top 10. Like when buying animals, this game is not just for Christmas, this is an investment. Cybernoid and Cybernoid 2, its sequel, are perfect in every way a computer game should be. And the tune that plays in the background is magnificent. I mean, just look at the sprites and the background colour. And for once, look, we didn't get a specky port, which means no attribute clash. If you give it the attention and the time it deserves, it's probably one of the best Amstrad games ever made. Superheroes Nick Brutti and David Perry struck again on the Amstrad CPC with Dan Dare 3. Not only were they responsible for two of the best games on the Amstrad in Savage and Trantor, The Last Stormtrooper, they took their skills and experience a step further with Dan Dare 3. And despite a sometimes cramped playing area, the visual flair is some of the best I've ever seen on the Amstrad CPC. It's a shame there's not more animation on the end of level meek and bosses, but I suspect, like most Amstrad games, they simply weren't given enough time. In Darkman, you get to bash everybody up. In fact, this was a nice little surprise from Ocean. It was kind of like a mixture of Batman and Robocop, with a pinch of Dragon Ninja all rolled up into one. It's all highly familiar stuff, and like with Robocop and the other games mentioned, this one has its moments. I quite like the graphics and colour used in this game, and especially Darkman's sprite. All the bells and whistles you'd expect are there as well, and personally, I can't recommend this enough. Ah, good old deflector, eh? Make use of mirrors to bend a laser beam from generator to receiver. There are 60 levels of mind-bending puzzles available. If you're the type that's into a good brain massage, a deflector should, in theory, appeal to anybody. As far as I'm aware, there's nothing else quite like it on the 8 bits or the 16 bits. And the great thing is, it seems to have pitched that difficulty curve just right. So then, a unique and enjoyable game. Good old Dizzy comes rolling back in this third instalment of the series. The first thing you need to do with Dizzy 3 on the Amstrad CPC is find a way to turn off that bloody music. I was lucky and found a multi-face code that did just that. Apparently it only took one month to program and it was the best selling of all the Dizzy games. And get this, Fantasy World Dizzy appears in the book 1001 Video Games You Must Play Before You Die. And Amstrad Action gave this one 89% and said the Olivers reached Dizzy New Heights. I know Driller and Darkseid, they look great, but they can feel a little bit sedate-like in 2021, but the challenge is still there, and it's a fantastic game. I sounded a bit like creepy Joe Biden there. Also, what's strange about this game is the Amstrad's version sound effects were the result of a competition in Amstrad Actions magazine. How bloody awesome was that? Plus, this was a game... Uh, originally uh, conceived, designed and intended for the Amstrad CPC that was then ported to the other systems. A thinking man's gauntlet. Way back in 1986, Amstrad Action awarded this 93% and master game status. And they went on to say, the variety of graphics, monsters and mazes will keep you wanting to play. And the eight increasingly difficult floors will present an excellent challenge. And just to add to that, the action is fast, furious and tactical too. And the Golem allows for two to play. It's just great for a quick blast. Surely has got to be the ultimate space game and is arguably better on the Amstrad CPC than any of the other 8-bit conversions. I mean this game features colourful 3D vector graphics and the space battle sequences uh, the most exciting of any game that I've ever played. Not surprisingly then, this was the first game, or one of the first games, to have a fan club. It also holds the Guinness World Records for appearing on more formats than any other computer game. 
and Amstrad Action gave this a master game. So Emlyn Hughes International Soccer, without question, the best football game on the Amstrad CPC. Yes, better than Match Day 2. Yes, better than Gaza 2. And if you're a football fan, the best two-player game, full stop, on the Amstrad CPC. In fact, Amstrad Action awarded this 93% and gave it a Master Game Award. Rest assured then that you ain't played footy on your CPC till you've mastered Emlyn. Exelon is still a fantastic little shooter, very addictive to play. And it's great to see that Mode Zero was being pushed to its limits. Enemy explosions are its party trick. Just look at those graphics, they look really detailed and colourful. There's also a really good challenge, where each new screen will bring you a whole host of new problems. If you get anywhere near the fifth screen, you're doing well. Stick with it, as each time you play, you'll see slightly more progress. Good luck though, there's 25 screens. How strange that this came from a simulation giant digital integration. So what we've basically ended up with here is uh, a game where you wipe aliens out over three stages. And although the game, once you've mastered it, is quite short, maybe 20 minutes or more to complete it, it's an absolute visual treat. Unbelievable then that this game was a part-time pet project. This is another Dave Perry and Nick Bruti special, but unfortunately they only coded it on the ZX Spectrum. But round of applause for Richard Naylor. Fantastic job. I feel the need, the need for speed. Ow! Talk to me, Goose. Okay, it's not Top Gun, but goodness me, it's the closest I think we ever got. So largely thanks to F-16 Combat Pilot and Fighter Bomber, for huge months, swathes of my childhood, I was able to play out as Maverick. And here's the crazy thing, it's still highly playable. And I can see why this deserved a master game status back in the day. I'll take you right into the danger zone. Goodness me, I got carried away with that. Moving swiftly on, this is one of the best budget games ever to grace the Amstrad CPC. Your mission couldn't be simpler. Locate a giant brain and take it out with a bomb. Good luck though, I'm still trying some 30 odd years later. Amstrad Action gave this a well-deserved rave and Amtix even turned around and said, Fly Spy is a very impressive budget title and should really be classed as two games in one. They go on to say that it's a well thought out puzzle that proves taxing at first but becomes extremely enjoyable and satisfying to play. Oh, you are a disgrace! Hey Buzz, for missing the target from there you want bloody shooting! Back in the day everybody wanted to be the next Brian Clough. And this along with Tracksuit Manager are where fantasy and dreams were made. And how about this for goal of the month? Pick that sucker out of the net. So then, my favourite strategy game on the Amstrad CPC. No contest. This is the Formula 1 game that got Codemasters all in a tiz, uh, who felt that the cover design ripped off their Grand Prix simulator title. Uh, believe it or not, this really captures the spirit and the feel of Formula 1. I'm really proud and happy to uh, have this in my collection and it's one I used to play with my granddad all the time. Naturally, if you're not into F1 or racing games or strategy of any type, obviously give this one a miss. I've also been watching Formula 1 Drive to Survive on Netflix and that made me go and revisit this. Fruity Frank is the ultimate cherry picker. For 1984, the presentation, the graphics and sound are absolutely unbelievable. And if you're not happy with the slow pace, you can increase the speed. Sadly, I didn't discover this game until late 1988 uh, in our local uh, news agents, but it still felt fresh and highly playable then. Today, in 2021, I still think it remains an underrated classic. And you can get it on the MSX as well. The arcade machine came custom built with two powerful processors. The Amstrad, a single Z80, 
A sight for sore eyes then, not once but twice, that we got fantastic arcade conversions on the humble CPC. Once you've selected your character, trust me, Questor is the most powerful. It then doesn't matter which adventure you choose, one or two, or deeper dungeons, they are all great. And dare I say it, Gauntlet 3 was actually okay despite being a specky ball. The ultimate 16 color classic. Heavily inspired by Night Law, Coda, Remy, Herbulot basically wanted a game like Night Law, but in full Amstrad color, with a sci-fi spin. He not only succeeded once, but twice with the sequel, Get Dexter 2. Exploring all the rooms within Get Dexter is where the most fun he's had. And today, it still looks as good as it plays. And it was also ported to the MSX2 and the Atari ST. A truly magnificent marvel of a game for the Amstrad CPC. Ghostbusters 2 is yet another example of how a movie license can actually work on a humble 8-bit. Good old Amstrad Action gave this a master game with a rating of 94%. Amstrad Action went on to say, if you want great gaming fun, give the Ghostbusters a call. They're back in business. And visually, this compares quite well with the 16-bit counterparts, but more importantly, it succeeds in capturing the atmosphere of the movie. Graphically, Grisor is pretty much state-of-the-art for the Amstrad CPC, um, with its huge character sprites and impressive backgrounds and really good animation. There'll always be the criticism about the lack of scroll, but I really do believe that the programmers made the right decision, the right call, by implementing a flick screen scroll. You can actually hold down the fire button and crouch and fire in all eight directions. It's not only probably the best arcade conversion on the Amstrad CPC, but the best 8-bit. I love a good Defender clone. And I love the control of the ship and the dependability of the gunplay. It's awesome. What is still a surprise for me is just how sleek this entire game is. I don't know if this is true or not, but apparently Alligator Software was supposed to have released this and decided not to, and then it was later bought out by High Tech Software. So Alligator had literally just sat on the code, probably for years, and then um, High Tech released it. I love it. Shoot to thrill. Does this well-groomed adventure game still play as good as it looks? It's a horrible cliche, but you really do have to experience Guild of Thieves uh, running, or, or better, play it to understand its, its true beauty. Inexperienced adventure players will be able to just rock up in this game. It's because it's just instantly accessible, and it's perfect to get the kids into and uh, help out with their reading, uh, writing and spelling. So everybody wins. See box, buy game, play game. Sleep, rinse eyes and repeat. That's how good this game is. Definitely Ocean's best ever adventure and the finest isometric 3D game ever created. It borrows heavily from Night Law and Batman before it, but the beautiful locations and visuals keep things fresh. Head Over Heels is a fantastic achievement in storytelling and gameplay, truly unmissable for your Amstrad CPC, and better than the ZX Spectrum version. Heartland is an enormously rewarding adventure. It will draw you in and it will keep you there. It's still a class product, gorgeous, playable, and it moves at quite a fast pace. You'll need to map this one to get anywhere other than the first level, and there's five wonderful thought out levels. All that's left to do is find the missing pages of the book, collect the white ones, destroy the black ones, kill all the wizards, and transport to the next level all within the time limit. If you can do that, you're a far better games player than me. If you're looking for a Rambo game on the Amstrad CPC, look no further than Ikari Warriors. It took just six weeks to program and was later ported to the ZX Spectrum, not David Perry's finest hour, featuring armor-piercing tanks, upgrades to your ammo, and grenades that would take out an entire street block. Feeling vulnerable? Just hop into an armor-piercing tank for the ultimate protection.
Retro Gamer described Akari Warriors as Commando in Overdrive. And I think this just might be the best arcade conversion ever to the Amstrad CPC. I'm going to say it, Impact has the edge over Arkanoid. In fact, like Arkanoid, it uses every colour in the Amstrad's arsenal. Each brick, each alien, when you hit it on Impact, has its own sound. I discovered this one late in the Amstrad CPC's life, and it's a great way to pass away the odd evening or Sunday. And get this, you can even design your own screens. I believe there's over 80 levels in total, so best of luck. Congratulations to those that are still with us. Just take a while, sit back and look at these graphics. Owning an Amstrad CPC at times was quite a painful experience. And due to the bad specy ports, you were often ridiculed almost for owning one. For the most part, they were probably right. But when this came along, I had no hesitation in shoving it right under their noses. Purely for comedy value and to watch their jaws drop. This one was actually banned in Germany. <laughs> I've heard that the Amstrad CPC version is considered the weakest of the 8-bits, but I don't think so. This, uh, for me, is excellent stuff. The reason they give is that you have to pause the game to get the status panel up. I mean, the bias towards the 64 and Specky back in the day in the magazines was ridiculous. So no, this is an excellent game, a fantastic game. And I personally played this one to death. Set over 21 screens, you'll need to bomb Dr. Destructo's ships, oil tankers and aircraft carriers. Once you've done that, it's onto his island retreat and wipe him out forever. This is a proper kill or be killed. Fantastic little real-time shooter. The control system is perfect. The graphics are sweet as a nut. And the sound provides a fantastic atmosphere. If you're into your shoot-em-ups, this is one you have to try on the Amstrad CPC. Jack the Nipper for me sums up the golden age of computer games. I always thought that Gremlin graphics pushed the envelope in regards to game design and graphics, but here they just showed how naughty they are. Jack is a little monster. It really is a must play. You can cause havoc in almost any room. And how much fun was it when you found the bubblegum? Pete Harrop and Greg Holmes took their time with the Amstrad CPC version and created an absolute classic. In fact, it looks better than the ZX Spectrum, but don't let them know that. Anyone for tennis? I mean table tennis? It's a fantastic arcade conversion. I don't know what more to say. There was a whole string of early arcade games that were converted to the Amstrad and they were done really well and this is one of them. I got really good at this game, I used to be able to compete at all levels with the computer. Oh and just a special mention for Tiebreak, that was a fantastic tennis game as well. We were very lucky to have both of these games on the Amstrad. This is wonderful to look at, beautiful to play, silky smooth. Uh, I love the way the hills come towards you, the rolling hills. It's just a great port for the Amstrad CPC, something I just didn't expect. Every now and again I sit down with it and I try to plough a few hours into it. But then the doorbell rings or somebody calls me or I've got to go somewhere and I completely lose my train of thought. But rest assured, it's a great game. Talking of great games, this is one of my favourites. And it's sometimes the simple game that uh, wins through. Uh, an example would be Death Chase on the ZX Spectrum, later converted to the Amstrad CPC. That game was less than 16K in size, but it stuck with me forever. And the music in this is brilliant. Proper foot tapping stuff. And people slag Codemasters off, but for £1.99, you were pretty much always guaranteed a good game. I'm just going to give this game a moment of silence out of respect. Thank you. 
I'm still waiting for somebody to tell me how this was possible on the Amstrad CPC. I know Cygnosis were a talented bunch, but what? How? The music and the presentation and the control system. Okay, so you didn't use a mouse, but other than that, it was brilliant. And I had so much fun being wasteful with their lives and sending them plowing to their death. But maybe this should be another video. Games on the Amstrad CPC that shouldn't be possible. I'm not going to lie to you, I had lots of fun with this game. Uh, at first I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, but then you slowly get into it and you can play the game at uh, a speed that's suitable to you. Uh, as you get better at it, you can you can up the speed as well. So the programmer behind this, what a wonderful job, and um, you know what a great idea. The learning curve is good as well. It lets you uh, get some way into the game before it ups the difficulty. I'm just surprised that uh, it didn't get a master game. This was one of the first games, uh, shooting games, apart from the Galactic Play that I purchased for my Amstrad CPC and let me tell you this I was not disappointed now it's not as smooth as Mission Genocide or Warhawk but it's got bags of playability and there's a real challenge there and it's quite difficult as well you won't just walk this one and that's why it makes the list because it's still a challenge one of my favorite James Bond movies so imagine my surprise when we ended up with this. It feels a little bit like the engine that they used for Buggy Boy, only a little bit faster and a little bit more refined. There's a good game here, there's plenty to do, there's a fantastic challenge. Yes, it'd be lovely if there was a little bit more to it, but what we did get is a solid, competent game. I suspect that they ran out of memory, uh, as there's nobody driving the boat. And I'm gutted there isn't an 8-bit rendition of Live and Let Die. I believe this was originally released as a game called Aquablast, but then quickly renamed, rebranded, as publisher Domark quickly spotted the connection with the speedboat and Live and Let Die. Talk about dodgy marketing. But the game itself is hunky-dory. Set over 20 deadly caverns, backed by an elaborate Monty Python-esque intro of music. Our main protagonist, Minor Willy, needs to collect all kinds of keys from within the caverns. Only then can he move on to the next level. Graphics are minimal, but with smooth animation and tight controls. And like with Donkey Kong in the arcade and on the Amstrad CPC, once you complete the last 20th stage, unfortunately, you go back right to the start but then it becomes about chasing that high score. Although Matthew Smith didn't actually program the game on the Amstrad CPC, this is every bit as playable as the original ZX Spectrum version, if not better. Prepare for lots of game over screens and for being promptly stomped on by a giant booth. Not only a great cartoon, but a fantastic game as well. The Amstrad can't scroll my arse. As you can see here, smooth multi-directional scroll. I love talking about this game, I've done so on many an occasion, and I just like to show people how great it is. I mean, look at the colour in use, look at the smoothness of the scroll, but more importantly, look how well animated everything is. And the good news as well is that Gremlin, on programming this game, got the difficulty just right. Football loopy nuts are we, we're all football loopy. I think I mentioned before, until Emlyn News International Soccer came along, this was the number one uh, football game on the Amstrad CPC. But it's not by a massive margin. Emlyn Hughes International Soccer just clinches it on a few technical improvements. But this is still a fantastic little game of soccer. And it makes the list because in my personal humble opinion, it plays just as good, if not better than FIFA. <laughs> You're not singing anymore. You're not singing anymore. This one was a nice little surprise back in the day. It looks good, it moves really fast, the controls are accurate, 
The screen gets really busy, but there's no slowdown whatsoever. Now I thought this game was programmed by Steve Baker, who did Turbo Chopper Simulator for Codemasters, but I read on CPC Game Reviews that the guy that did Masters of Space and Star Driver for Radical Software is the same guy that programmed this. I still can't believe Amstrad Action only gave this a rave. They gave it 85% and said, very original combination of flight sim, shoot em up and adventure. On the other hand, Amtix gave it 94% and they went on to cite the animation is some of the best I've seen on the Amstrad with judder free vector graphics that really create a substantial amount of atmosphere. I'm going with Amtix on this one and think that Bob Wade uh, of Amstrad Action had a massive brain fart. David K. Pridmore is the guy that programmed this game. He also programmed Rich Dangerous 1 and 2 for the Amstrad CPC and Monty Python's Flying Circus. I'm just looking what else. Skate Crazy, Tempest. Now my daughter likes this game as well and she insisted that it had to be in the list. I think it's just a really good kids game. I personally loved this back in the day. Played it for bloody ages. I've been asked on a few occasions now, what decent arcade conversions did US Gold make? Well, here's one, Metro Cross. I also think 1943 was decent and 720. And I remember really liking Express Raider on the, on the Amstrad and the Gauntlet conversions were sublime. And compared to the other 8-bit versions, Kung Fu Master on the Amstrad was brilliant. And I almost forgot about Rygar. Oh, what about Alien Storm and UN Squadron? That was decent. Okay, it's 2021 and this type of isometric game has been done to death. But, just because it's an isometric game doesn't mean that everybody can make great use of it. And as many good games as you get, you get as many bad. I challenge anyone to play Head Over Heels and come away thinking that that isn't a great game. What makes this stand out above the rest are the graphics. But the gameplay is great, the puzzles are solvable. Try it. Programmed by the same genius of Spin Dizzy and Duke Nukem 3D. The seemingly impossible on the Amstrad CPC. Smooth vertical scroll. Courtesy of the one, the only, great Sir Paul Shirley. My mate owned the 64 version of this and I used to ram this right under his nose. But they had a great version of Warhawk so he used to ram that back at me. So one might say touche, but Shirley proved the CPC can live with the C64. The amazing David K. Pridmore strikes again with Monty Python's Flying Circus on the Amstrad CPC. Quite how they thought they could transfer the comedy elements into a video game or computer game is, is world beyond me. And there's also a few mini games uh, thrown in. Uh, one in particular has you playing a breakout clone. It's a particularly pleasant game. And it's well up to Core Design's previous standards. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I work all night and I sleep all day. Ant Hartley worked on Back to the Future Part 3, Outrun Europa, Tie Break, Sim City, Rygar, and I believe he also helped with Savage. And as Amstrad Action said, Mr. Helly can stand and blast with the best. But it's computer and video games in 1989 gave it 86% and said a cute and solid shoot 'em up with lots of trigger happy action. Now, wow, one of my favourite Amstrad CPC games is actually a specy port. It's definitely within my top 10. Amstrad Action gave this one a master game and I quote, as an arcade adventure, myth is unsurpassed. It has depth and cunning gameplay, suddenly blending joystick speed and grey matter power to a near perfect degree. Luck and guesswork become integral to your success. Highly recommended stuff. There's eight towers to blow up. You do this by making your way all the way to the top. At the time this game was considered revolutionary and it's akin to something that might have been conceived on a console. The side-scrolling collect em up uh, submarine level is missing, sadly, from the Amstrad CPC. But the core mechanics, the core gameplay has survived. And this is an essential game on any computer platform or console.
It's the first officially licensed Nigel Mansell game. Back in 1988, there were only 16 circuits and they're all accounted for here. It's a weird one because you've got the cockpit view and the behind the car view. Now this guy also did Supercycle on the Amstrad CPC and it's easy to see the comparison because as with Supercycle, the pseudo 3D screen update was really fast. Now this is one of the best looking games on the Amstrad CPC and it's a direct port from the Atari ST version. Now the Atari ST version looks 50 times better but it's great being able to play out the American Civil War from both sides. Uh, the game is based on the European comic book series uh, known in English as the Blue Jackets and it's another game that appeared in the 1001 video games you need to play before you die and it's absolutely essential. Even these side-scrolling horizontal arcade levels are done really well. Issue 6, 1989, Computer and Video Games gave this the award of Golden Joystick and it was for the best 8-bit arcade conversion. Ace Magazine in 1988 awarded it 89%, citing the most colourful and with the fastest scroll of the lot. Terrific, if mindless fun. In the same year, the Games Machine awarded it 89% as well, citing the best of the 8-bit versions. P47 is a really good uh, arcade conversion on the Amstrad CPC. Some of the later levels are absolutely breathtaking. It's really faithful to the arcade original. It feels like it runs at about the same pace. There's a smaller screen, a smaller display, but it just feels like you're playing the coin-up original. So what more can you, you know, honestly wish for? Completely came out of the blue for me. A fantastic, wonderful arcade conversion. There's over 35 moves in this game. You use the gym in the game to unlock your character's abilities. And you can even preset, as in customize controls, for your favorite moves. The chap that programmed this, Pascal Jarry, also did Turbo Cup, uh, D-Day, Mission, and MGT. But he was also the internal development manager in one of my favorite games of all time, Porsche Challenge, on the PlayStation 1. I was absolutely gutted when I got my first paper round. You, you had to get off your bike and drop it through the letterbox. I wanted to throw it and smash a few windows. Now the original version didn't come with any music or sound in game, but it was later re-engineered and music was added. Now I played this before I played the arcade uh, original, and if you're good at this, you're good at the arcade version. I remember I used to listen to the 80s group Poison and play to this. Okay, so it came out a bit late in the Amstrad's life, 1992, but I kid you not, this is absolutely essential. You'll hardly ever see this in anyone's top 10 or top 20 list. And I guess that's largely because, including myself, uh, a lot of people had moved on to the 16-bit scene by that time. But this guy, Dave Thompson, he was prolific in the later years of the Amstrad CPC's life. He did Top Cat, Future Bike Simulator, Blazing Thunder, and Crystal Kingdom Dizzy. Another game where Amstrad Action awarded a master game. They gave this one 91% and they said mold breaking racing fun. In terms of a challenge, perhaps the CPC's greatest racing game, you've got five tracks to choose from, each with five stages. That's massive. There's also 12 drivers that you can choose from and you'll need to place third or higher to qualify. I promise if you give this one a try, you won't regret it. Now this is a massive improvement over the first prehistoric game. The first game was plagued with uh, slowdown. Now this one didn't come out until 1993. So again, most people have moved on by this point. But I did play it around 2001 and it blew me away, especially the Amstrad Plus version. But this is probably one of the best games on the CPC. Another master game from Amstrad Action, but it's the review from Computer and Video Games in 1991 where they gave it 94%.
This platform game scored highly on 16 bits because of the amazing animation on the main sprites and the great mixture of lethal traps and puzzles. Let's put it this way, we're absolutely amazed by the quality of the Amstrad conversion. And I've personally played this on lots of different systems, uh, the Sega Mega CD, the SNES, and I prefer the Amstrad. It's the 1930s and New York is overrun by gangsters. Gameplay is quite simple. You see the city streets uh, and the enemy and you just have to pop them off one at a time. There's a bonus stage at the end of each level where you have to take out a bunch of gangsters in a room. So this one's against the clock. Gangsters become harder to find. And I'm not sure if this is true or not, but apparently it supports four-way hardware scroll. The chap behind this also did Mystical uh, in 1990 and the and Purple Saturn Day. Now this is a great one to while away a few hours, uh, but technically it's just really impressive and really fast. It's also really tough, but if you keep at it, it does get easier. It's not an essential game, but it really does show what the CPC is capable of. I guess what I mean is it's all done to a high standard. This is a short game, but highly recommended because it's fast and it's fun. And you can select a skateboard or a BMX. Now there's only three courses, but there's a course designer, so you can design to your heart's content. To win, you've got to finish the course with the highest score. And the game is really basic, but the game is fun, and that's all that counts at the end of the day. And for once, we can rejoice. It's more colorful than the specky. I didn't really know much about this game uh, back in the day. I knew there was an arcade uh, version, and obviously I played Bubble Bobble, the original. In fact, the reason I purchased this game was down to the cover uh, from Bob Wakelin. And not only was it one of the best investments I ever made, it's also one of the best games I ever played, and I've never been able to put it down. The main character, Sprite, is a bit ropey. It flickers every now and again, but the game itself is essential. I would say borderline masterpiece. Rampage is in there because it's more than the sum of its parts. For example, if one of the other players dies, you can eat their corpse, which brilliantly gives you full health. Plus, there's not many games I can think of where you can play three player simultaneously. And whilst I haven't made the best use of Mode Zero, it's great to see the game playing out in 16 colour. My only criticism is, I wish there was more gore. Another absolute timeless classic. Amtix give this an accolade. Uh, and Amstrad Action gave it a master game with a review score of 91% out of 100. In fact, I'll read you a snippet from their review. They went on to say, Superb is the only way to describe Rana Rama. Shoot him up, hop along, cast a spell and turn me back to a prince are elements of the magical game. It is a worthy contender for number one spot. So the same person behind Rebel Star is the same person team behind the later XCOM series. It's a turn-based tactical squad combat game and this game also features in 1001 video games to play before you die. What I find weird is strangely Amstrad Action only gave this 82%. In fact, I would have thought they'd have marked this game up due to it being a full price game in budget software clothing. Oh dear, your girlfriend has been kidnapped on the streets of Brooklyn. You sent her out to get some weed, but unfortunately, a gang of street punks had other ideas. Sadly, the scrolling had to be sacrificed, but this is definitely 100% the best 8-bit conversion, and easily the most violent. I mean, Jesus Christ on a bike. Look at those graphics. I bet the last level where you face the big boss is the inspiration for the Matrix as you'll need to dodge bullets, just like Neo. Your mission is to rescue stranded pilots. Once you've collected the quota of stranded pilots, it's time to return to the mothership. 
but there's even night missions as well. The enemy aliens called Jaggies are named after the jagged lines you get on sprites and polygons. It's basically a search and rescue game, but I remember this one giving me nightmares. When you locate a pilot, you land your ship near him and open the airlock to let him in. But be careful, it could be a Jaggy. An utterly bonkers beginning that completely ripped off Raiders of the Lost Ark. We loved it and it delivered a truly pulse pounding moment and probably one of the most memorable openings to a game of all time. And despite the AA rave from Amstrad Action, I'd go as far to say one of the best 2D platform games of all time. Despite being squeezed into a tiny little window, Rick Dangerous 2 is just as good as the 16-bit game. It's still a class product, gorgeous, playable and supremely fast. Rick Dangerous 2 hasn't changed a bit, it's just like riding a bike. But what happened to Rick Dangerous 3? Judging by the last screen, the end game screen, I thought we were promised a third game. Regardless, this is a true sequel to the original Rick Dangerous, and it doesn't depart from a winning formula. Ah, Robocop. Do you remember the four prime directives? Well, the first one is serve the public trust. The second is protect the innocent. And the third is uphold the law. Ah, but can you remember the fourth? Answers on a postcard. Or just leave a comment. What a load of nonsense then, when Specky fans claim that their version of Robocop is better than the Amstrad. This is it. This is the definitive version outside of the arcade. Plus the Specky version is too easy, and this is better than the Game Boy version. This managerial style game is probably responsible for the most fun I've had playing a video game. Whilst it's not essential, it's definitely one of Codemasters best. Getting your first number one chart hit, which believe me takes a lot of luck, is a proper punch the air moment. And the graphics despite not being mode zero, are done really well and I'm sure there's more than four colours on display. There's also a good variety of tunes that play away in the background. And a lot of the people you sign are strangely familiar. Now I had this back in the day and it's split over three different levels. One of the levels is a side-scrolling horizontal shoot 'em up and it's really good. It's a big, tough and very colourful game and it's a commendable effort because they've tried to do something different. I suspect some people will be put off the first level but for me it's a really good blaster and it can't be that bad because AA gave it a rave. So three shooting games and one tape what more can you ask for? For me, definitely the best looking of the 8 bits, and I'd also wager the most playable. I'd imagine your typical Amstrad collector would definitely have this one in their collection. I'd also say it's one of the best multi event games uh, that the Amstrad has seen. Certainly the most adrenaline pumped. Now I've only ever played this two player but apparently you can play with three players as well. So a very simple but really enjoyable multi-event game. Apparently the ZX Spectrum version of this sold over 350,000 copies. Does anybody know how many copies the Amstrad CPC sold? Saberman, the protagonist of this game, also makes a cameo appearance in Banjo Tui. You stumble across him and he's been frozen solid in ice since 1984. So if you've never played that game, check it out, it's really fun. I'm not going to say this one's essential, but it's definitely up there. You need to experience it on the Amstrad CPC. For me, Antiriad is one of those games that it's essential until you've completed it. So if you haven't, you need to play this on the Amstrad CPC. Despite the limited physics and flick screen affair, for me, this is one of the finest platformer games. And it's the best version of one of the best games of all time, if that makes sense. So you best be playing this. And if you're lucky enough to pick up a copy, it's a great collection piece. David Perry and Nick Bruti not satisfied with Trantor, the last Stormtrooper. They really wanted to show what the Amstrad CPC was capable of and how well it could scroll. As a team, it's almost as if there's nothing they couldn't achieve together on the Amstrad CPC. This is an absolutely terrific game split over three levels where level two feels like Space Harrier slash Death Chase that appeared on the ZX Spectrum. Just play it, it's brilliant, it's a fantastic experience. Be afraid, the Sentinel is watching. 
The idea is you start at the bottom and you have to move around squares to eventually get almost near the top to absorb the sentinel. Even the trees uh, turn nasty. It also uses the Amstrad's hardware scroll. Amtix awarded this 98% and they said, in our view, it's the best game ever. With 9,999 levels, they might just be right. You've just arrived in Hollywood. It's your first movie. As you can see, Seymour is no Tom Cruise. He looks more like a blob. Oh well, we've got plenty of those in the West Midlands. Borrows heavily from the Dizzy series, but sticks to the same great formula whilst improving on it. So the film director Dirk has gone missing somewhere in Miami and you as Seymour, you've arrived, you just found this out and now you've got to direct and produce your own movie. It's brilliant and it's massive. Graphically, Shadow Dancer looks a little bit blocky. The sound is nothing to write home about and there's no music that plays throughout. But it's the gameplay where Shadow Dancer stands out from the rest. In fact, it plays identical to the arcade original. So if you've never played this on the Amstrad CPC, drop everything and get this game. It's probably the finest example of 8-bit ninja action. And the difficulty curve is just right. Now despite the weird, hmm, I can't make up my mind on the graphics, the gameplay is rock solid. And if you like the arcade original, there's no reason why you won't like this. There's a great challenge there and it's easy to pick up and play. Now when I purchased this in the late 80s, I played it for hours, hours on end, probably weeks. And whilst I prefer the arcade version, I still dabble nipping to this every now and again. So yeah, another brilliant conversion, arcade conversion for the Amstrad CPC. How lucky were we? Thank you, Richard Applin. Thank you very much. So this game's title is an apparent homage to John Bruner's uh, 1975 sci-fi novel, The Shockwave Rider. The game takes place in the future and you literally have to navigate on the shockwave, which are these moving platforms, with the goal being to do a full circle. It's absolute bizarre, but I remember as a child loving it and, and couldn't get enough of it. And even today, I'm still mad for it. So it's in the list. We all loved this movie back in the 80s. And the game is everything you could have really hoped for. The graphics are probably some of the best uh, I've personally seen on the Amstrad. Up there we get Dexter and get Dexter 2. So the game didn't disappoint me. And I remember putting hours into this. It probably took me about two or three weeks to complete it. Amtix gave this 91% and they went on to say, Short Circuit has something for everyone, an arcade adventure and an action game. Welcome to the Puck of Dreams. It's you versus the AI of the computer and several competitors. Be prepared though, a lot of these competitors are downright dirty and will cheat. You couldn't wish for a game with more simplicity. The graphics are finished in mode zero, which means 16 color, and as you can see, a high quality. It's a shame you're denied a two player game, but I really like it, and it's a good adaptation of the air hockey games that we used to play in the arcades. I think I played this more than I did pretty much any other shoot 'em up on the Amstrad CPC, uh, more so probably than uh, Light Force. It doesn't look much, but it's colourful, hectic, and it's very tough, a great challenge. I think I loved it because of the two-player element. And if you think the game is a tad slow, just press the T key to speed things up. It's nothing special by today's standards, but I do remember having fun with this one. The magazines back in the day, um, computer and video games, uh, and the games machine, didn't really like Squeak on the Amstrad CPC. But interestingly, Computer and Video Games gave it 62% and they said, incredibly, even cuter sprites than on the ST and Amiga versions, but suffers from a flip screen rather than a scrolling playing area. But I think if you can look past the uh, flick screen, you've got a game here that's as good as on any other platform. As the French know how to make a game. There's no question here, David Perry and Nick Brucey strike again and bring us a great conversion of a great arcade game. Can you just imagine if these guys would have done Green Beret 
Outrun, Turbo Outrun, Ghost and Goblins, Dolls and Ghosts, and would probably have shifted a hell of a lot more units. These guys are definitely heroes of the CPC. Absolute legends. Essential game. So with this and Shadow Dancer, there's two fantastic uh, arcade conversions from US Gold. So two more to add to the list. Now the guy that programmed this is the same Chris Woods that did the graphics for Super Hangon. So what the bloody hell happened here? Did he discover Mode Zero for the first time? I think he also went on to do Netherworld, which again was amazing graphically, and Fire and Ice on the Amiga. Woohoo! Originally when I first had this one, it took me a while to get used to it. Uh, I didn't have a clue what you had to do. And then a friend came over and he showed me. A thing to bear in mind is graphically back then, this was the best uh, arcade adventure, the best graphics I'd seen on the Amstrad. It's still enjoyable uh, and it's still quick as well. It's well animated. I mean, look at it. And despite some sprite collision, it appears to have stood the test of time. As far as I know, this is Paul Hunter's only game he programmed on the Amstrad CPC. But what an impression he left. Yes, there's some criticism over the vector trees and other buildings used, but what's the alternative? Space Harrier 2. What a load of tripe that was. So I'd rather a Space Harrier with concessions than no Space Harrier at all. I grew up on this, it's absolutely brilliant. Spin Dizzy, eh? This game appears in the book 1001 Video Games You Need to Play Before You Die. And the Amstrad CPC version is the original. So you play as Gerald, gyroscopic, exploration, landing device. There's 385 screens to traverse. The controls are rotated 90 degrees, which makes it hard at first to uh, avoid not falling off the edges and collect the energy crystals throughout. It's an absolute classic. You can play one player versus the computer or versus a friend. And basically... One spy has got to try and outsmart the other spy. And you can do this by using any of the objects in the game to set booby traps. Amtix awarded this 94% and they said it's worth coming from the cold for. Amstrad Action also rated it 90% and they went on to say this is a program which captures fully the manacle humour of the cartoon strip. I couldn't believe it when this came out on the Amstrad CPC. I first saw it on the Saturday morning ITV kids show, Get Fresh. And basically two kids had to battle their way through it to get the high score. And don't quote me on this, but was this probably the first instance in UK television history of a computer game being included on television like this? So fast forward to March 1987 and Amstrad Action gave this a well-deserved 91%. What an absolute stunner of a game. And it's never the same each time you play. The items are dispensed in different locations throughout the map. And you have to map this. In fact, Amtix gave this one 91% in July 1986 and said, Stephen Crow deserves the hit and you deserve to treat yourself. Amstrad Action gave it 80% uh, the same year. And they said, it's nothing very exciting to look at, but a big task and lots of nice touches. Back in 1986, this was epic. You had to take out the defense system for 22 planets. The space combat is up there with Elite in regards to how intense it is. And the remarkable thing about this is all the graphics, all the polygons are filled in. And the good thing is Star Strike 2 is easy to get into. And as you get better, you'll get further. So prepare for an interesting challenge. Apparently there's a Mega Drive, Sega Mega Drive version of this game and the fairies aren't naked, they're all covered up. Where's the bloody fun in that? A word of warning though, don't even bother playing this game unless you like your punishment. It's hard. It makes good use of the Amstrad's Mode Zero graphics and 16 colours. Amstrad Action in 1989 awarded it 92% and gave it a Master Game status. And they said quality is apparent in every aspect of Stormlord. This uh, completely came out of the blue for me uh, back in 1992. 
I'd pretty much moved on from the Amstrad CPC, but I kept it uh, stored away just in case anything came out because it wasn't quite dead from a commercial perspective. But this is a really ambitious game, a fantastic game to look at. And for those that loved Switchblade from Gremlin Graphics, this is just as good, if not better. If you ever hear people talking about racing games on the Amstrad CPC, seriously, look, look no further than Stunt Car Racer. In fact, there were two versions of the game for the Amstrad CPC, uh, for the 464 and the 6128. The latter came complete with an extra multiplayer mode and a Hall of Fame gallery. Uh, these two features did not exist in the CPC 464 version. Unbelievable. Well, I'm a bit of a sucker for cutesy platform games. Bubble Bobble, Rainbow Islands, Prehistoric 2, and then add Super Colden to that. I personally never thought I'd play anything this good uh, platform-wise on the Amstrad CPC. And I certainly didn't expect it from Titus or Titus uh, after playing uh, Titus the Fox. Don't get me wrong, that game was great, but it was bogged down with slowdown. At the time, this filled a very large gap for anybody that was wanting and waiting with baity breath for Hang On. David J. Looker has done a fantastic conversion here. It must be code from the original C64 because the game looks and plays identical. But look at the speed of this thing. The only other game, bike game, I can think of that I've had as much fun with uh, would have been Speaking from Mastertronic and 750cc Grand Prix. I hardly ever hear anybody discuss Super Pipeline 2. But um, for me, it's a fantastic game, and uh, I used to play this all the time as a kid. I mean, don't forget, this would have came out in 1985, and this would have cost less than two quid. All this game for less than two quid. I mean, there's a lovely catchy tune that plays along in the background. Everything is super smooth, looks good. The programming talent that worked on this game, unbelievable. We're all socialists at heart, but in this game, Robin Hood is a super socialist, or when it suits him. So Maid Marian has been kidnapped by the Sheriff of Nottingham, so it's up to Robin to take a short trip through Sherwood Forest with his band of merry men to take back his property. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding through the glen. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, with his band of men. Feared by the bad, loved by the good. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. Now it wasn't intentional, but I once sold a copy of Super Sports on tape, uh, on eBay, and it sold for around £60. Now I remember it being a half decent game, but not that good, not £60 good. So I revisited it, uh, played it through, and I have to say the music, the presentation, the graphics, the events and the long-term challenge are really good in this game and it makes the list. So I recently played this on the Sega Mega Drive, uh, a homebrew version, and absolutely loved that. Played it right until the end and that inspired me to go back to the Amstrad CPC version because I'd never completed it. And on revisiting, I was pleasantly surprised. It's every bit as good as the homebrew Mega Drive title and, well, probably one of the best games on the Amstrad. If there's one thing people would never accept today, it's a clone of the original, like the arcade original. They'd expect that in its entirety. But back in the 80s, we couldn't get enough of that sort of thing. Plus, outside of China, I don't even think it would be allowed anymore. So this Battlezone clone just literally goes on until you lose all your lives. So it's all about the high score. If you play this one in the dark, the light strobing effect is a real visual treat for the eyes. Definitely check this one out. Probably the Amstrad CPC's finest hour in regards to fighting games, combat games. 
Computer and Video Games in 1991 awarded it 90% and they said the Amstrad version of the original was little short of excellent and Target Renegade carries on the tradition in fine form. But for me, the winning formula of this game is working as a team, the two player option, it's so rewarding. Blasting robot defences on a 3D landscape with awesome game size and terrific strategy has never felt so good. The graphics aren't the best, but your imagination uh, naturally just fills in the blanks. You can't just jump into this game, uh, you've got to literally do your homework, a bit of reading. Once you're au fait with the controls and the story, boy are you in for a treat, and like any good game, it's really difficult to put down. This is another fantastic and wonderful arcade game converted to the Amstrad CPC. One of my favourite games of all time and it doesn't disappoint despite slowdown on the Amstrad CPC. Yes, you can play it on MAME or other emulation these days, far better um, conversions, including the Atari Jaguar version, but that's true of any 8-bit arcade conversion. But if you want to discover the hidden gems on the Amstrad, it'd be rude to ignore this. Thrust won't knock your socks off graphically, but its gameplay is truly out of this world. You've got to retrieve the pods with your asteroid-style spaceship, blow the reactor up and fly away from the planet. It really is the ultimate blasting whilst manoeuvring game. And like any game, there's a shelf life, even with Tetris. But this is one I come back to, and I'm sure thousands do. There's no place like Thrust. Well, for a time, Time Scanner was definitely the best uh, pinball game on the Amstrad CPC and it took just over 30 years to better it. And that was only down to the already genius design of Pinball Dreams and the amazing Batman group. Now if only they'd have made this game in Mode Zero. It's still worth playing because it's a splendid realistic pinball simulation and as a tried and tested formula, it works really well. Now this one was another surprise and it's not too dissimilar to the Amiga version and just look at the scroll. I kid you not, this one will keep you glued to the screen. It's a cross between Breakout, Arkanoid and Pong and there's 80 levels with 8 lives. If this one doesn't impress you with its super fast graphics, smooth scroll and 16 colour, I'm afraid the Amstrad CPC isn't the computer you are looking for. Of all the flight sims out there, Tomahawk is the one I've had the most fun with, the one I've spent the most time with, and the flight simulation that left the biggest impression on me. Gunship is really good as well, but this just pips it. And it doesn't pip it on simulation, it pips it on accessibility. There's four different missions. It blows Strike Force Harrier completely out of the sky. Amstrad Action awarded this 92%. And where they gave a second opinion, they went on to say, this game has just about everything you'd want, except the goggles. Until Castle Master, this was as close as you got to a fully bona fide FPS experience. You actually felt as if you were exploring ancient Egyptian pyramids. And it's not a feeling I got until years later playing Tomb Raider. It's also faster than the previous game. There's extra locations, more puzzles, and it even has a better atmosphere. It's definitely one not to be missed. The presentation, the music, the simple idea of the game. This is just one really well thought out game. If there is to be a negative, uh, it's that the two player option didn't survive the Amstrad translation. As a single player experience, it holds up really well and there's a fantastic challenge there. The game also has an energy about it that not many other games capture and I didn't stop playing this until I finally completed it. Your spaceship has crash landed on an alien planet and now it's up to you to get out there, find the pieces and put it back together. The only way to survive is keep moving as the action comes thick and fast. They don't come any simpler than this, it's a blast and search. Graphically it's an absolute stunner. 
And no surprise, it's CPC legends David Perry and Nick Brucey at the helm steering the CPC good ship. Cowabunga, dude! This one's awesome! I can't believe we got this on the Amstrad. I played it on the, obviously, arcade and the Super Nintendo. So the surprise to get this on the Amstrad, it was a revelation almost. And although not as good as the Super Nintendo version or the arcade, it brings with it its own charm. I just, I just feel so lucky that we got this on the Amstrad. And even luckier that it's not a specy port. I mean, as arcade conversions go for the Amstrad CPC, for me, this is bloody brilliant. The only thing missing is in-game music, but who cares? We're very lucky to have received this game uh, for the Amstrad CPC. It was one of Hi-Tech's Hanna-Barbera cartoon licenses, um, but apparently the studio went bust, and then Codemasters bought the Turbo license from them. And it's a pleasant surprise. It's good old-fashioned platforming action at its best. I wish the game played out in a bigger window, and don't get me wrong, it's no rival to Super Mario, but it has just enough variety on the Amstrad CPC to be considered one of its top games. Surely one of the best games ever on the Amstrad CPC, and that's just the first game. The second game trumps it, so a benchmark then, if you like, for all Amstrad CPC games from this day, from this point forward. I'd never experienced anything like this on the Amstrad CPC before. Certainly not to this quality. And Commodore 64 fans won't like this, but this plays just as good. And the shoot 'em up sections are ferocious, fast, furious. What this one lacks in color, uh, it more than makes up for in graphical detail and challenge and variety. In fact, Amstrad Action awarded this one 90% in 1990, and they said an Oscar-winning film license from Ocean. And the music captures the theme and the timeline of the movie. And I didn't discover this until it came out on budget, so even better, a great game of a great movie. I first played this game on a mate's Commodore 64, I was absolutely blown away and I remember saying to him I wish I could play this on the Amstrad and he turned around to me and said you can, it's definitely out, I've seen it. It wasn't long before I purchased my own copy and it was every bit as good as the Commodore 64 version. The story follows the exploits of Miyamoto Yasagi, a ninja master who serves no master. It's a cult classic. If you like a really tough challenge and I mean tough look no further than The Vindicator. It's a game that you'll play continuously over and over again until you've finally clocked it. It doesn't exploit the Amstrad's colour to its full. Graphics aren't as good as you'd like. And it's a mishmash of game styles, including a 1942-43 style shoot 'em up section. You'll need to map it, but I guarantee you by the end of it, you'll come away thinking, that was a good game. My god, I was blown away by this on the Amstrad CPC. I used to play this on the arcade machine in our local chip shop. The next minute, I'm loading up the Amstrad CPC version and I can't believe what I'm seeing. In fact, let me read you uh, the review from Amstrad Action. Uh, they gave it 90% and they said, Vindicators is a great arcade conversion. It's fast, furious and fun, especially in two player mode. I couldn't decide whether it was this or International Karate Plus that I was going to add to the list. I thought there's no point putting both in there. As I say that though, my mind's telling me that I've ballsed up and I should have included it because it is one of those games that I played the bejesus out of. Saying that though, this really is a fantastic game. I mean, Amstrad Action gave it 94%. And like an idiot, I still play it today. I sincerely doubt anybody will agree with me on this, but I think this is one of the best arcade conversions ever on the Amstrad CPC. And you might laugh at me, but it's more accessible as well than the arcade conversion. In other words, it's easier to play. And although it feels like there's a lack of variety on the track, the game ups the challenge the further you get. 
and I wish more games implemented the anti-skid protection that's built in. Once you get over the fact that the game doesn't scroll, you start to accept it and appreciate it for what it is. The Commodore 64 version is the definitive version and that's the place you really want to experience it. But saying that, this is absolutely fantastic. It's a serious game, a serious shoot 'em up. And I don't think the lack of scroll damages this game as much as people make out. So if you're into shooters, shoot 'em ups, horizontal shooters, they don't come better than this. Codemasters delivered again with Wild West Seymour. It's an improvement over the last game and it's even funnier. And despite what people say, this is not dizzy with a different sprite. Well, it looks a little bit like Dizzy. And you might think by 1992, this whole thing was getting a bit long in the tooth. But you're either a Dizzy Seymour fan or you're not. It's as simple as that. Winter Games is a work of art. An absolute picture that should be placed on anybody's wall. It's definitely a benchmark in how to do graphics on the Amstrad CPC. The screens for each event are fantastically drawn, but it's not just a tour de force in graphics. The game itself is highly playable, well thought out, and a dream to control. I particularly like Amtix's review on it from July 1986. They gave it 89%, and they said all the thrills of winter games without the worry of broken limbs. Mother of God, will you look at that? I doubt anybody would give Whizball the time of day on the Amstrad CPC, especially after playing the Commodore 64 version. But the reality is, this is a fantastic game on the Amstrad. It came at a time where they probably hadn't figured out how to get the CPC to scroll. And I looked at Amstrad Action's review in October 1987, and Amstrad Action gave it a Master Game Award and 92%, and they went on to say, Good combination of old and original ideas. Did we mention it was cute too? If you like rugby games, there is none better than this on the Amstrad CPC. I wish for the life of me it was finished in mode 0 and 16 colour, but please don't let that put you off or detract you from playing this game. It's only essential if you love rugby. It plays an authentic game. All the rules are there, as you'd expect. And playing this one instead of the real thing will save you all the scabs from your knees. I can't say for certain if this is the best shooter on the Amstrad CPC. It's certainly one of the most difficult. The gameplay is amazing, it's excellent. You can't really compare it to anything else. Of course it's a shoot 'em up but it's kind of added its own ideas. And the eight levels are just fast, furious and I've just never experienced anything like it on the Amstrad. I think Arc Developments are probably the best programmers ever. Some might say I've left the best until last, and I probably wouldn't disagree with that. I can't believe I've made it to the end of this video. It's taken me an absolute age. I hope it's been worth it, and I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'd like to think that those people new to the Amstrad We'll be able to refer to this and enjoy doing so. And I know I've said it a hundred times now, but if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe, please like the video, please share it with all your friends, and don't forget to ring that bell. Until next time, bye!